I think if you look at the World Economic Forum on when women and men will be equal, it's over 200 years. Welcome back to another episode of Zaftek Talks. Today we're going to be talking about International Women's Day and we have Tonya with us. Yes, I am the sales director in Zaftek and out in the field quite a lot and also of course inside of the company. And I think inclusion and diversity is a very interesting topic, and especially related to International Women's Day on how we will revolutionize something. Oh, that, that's great and good energy <laughs> to start the, the conversation. So I have lots of things to, to ask you that I've been wondering about and waiting all weekend to, to ask you. So finally it came, but let's start off by the elephant in the room and talking about why are we even having this conversation? It's 2024, we're having kind of, we're sitting in a beautiful room in a beautiful country one of the most socially progressive countries in the world, Norway. Do we even need a Women's Day? Why are we still having this? Why are we still mentioning this? I think if you look at the World Economic Forum on when women and men will be equal, it's over 200 years hmm. until full equality of women and men. And just when you look at those numbers, it's kind of, we think that in Norway, we're so equal. Yeah. But the unconscious bias that we have in our minds, uh, both when it comes to, say, female male, which has existed next to each other since, since Adam and Eve. <laughs> uh, and then you also, of course, have the, the aspect of the unconscious bias that comes to the, where you look at minorities in the workplace and how that is not only female men, but also the minorities. And when women and men has worked alongside with each other since the, the beginning, beginning of times, and we still have 200, 200 years until equality, it kind of, to me, it kind of blows my mind yeah. about how much work there really is to do. Yeah, so the, the glass ceiling is, is still very much there, not totally shattered just yeah. yet. Just, just like if you look at the most say, open numbers. I think men is earning uh, 61,000 and 90,000, uh, uh, 61,000 and 90 uh, a month, while women are down at 55,000. As an average. As an average yeah. pay per month. Yeah. Uh, so, so just looking there on how it all starts, women starts off with a lower salary and they never are able to negotiate to become equal. Mm. And that, that is just like the, the most basic things, the numbers that, that you look at, that we really very easily can go and impact as, as a workplace. Yeah, and that's, it's great that you're kind of centering this conversation around that the professional context or the workplace context, which is probably one of the most important things to, to talk about and for us to talk about Zaptic and beyond Zaptic. Mm -hmm. And the, the theme of this year's Women's Day is inspire inclusion. And it's a super juicy theme for us to to yes. unpack and I have a lot of questions about what is inclusion and whose job is it to inspire inclusion and what does this look like at Zaptec and beyond Zaptec but before that let's talk a little bit about you and and how you came to do the work that you are I think mm. a lot of people will know you as Tonya from Zaptec and you represent us internationally mm. but for a lot of people you represent many other things and you're kind of a, a voice for inclusion and diversity as it is so I was hoping you could share a little bit about what it is that you think you're representing right now and why you think it's important? Well, I think if you look at the, the numbers of, say, feeling of discrimination, 30% of women belonging to some kind of a minority mm. are feeling some kind of discrimination and 22% men are feeling uh, these feelings of discrimination. And, and, and when you look at these numbers, it's very important to kind of have people out there that are trying to somehow impact this and lower this. And um, some people might know and some people might not, but I, I wrote a book about basically shame and vulnerability and how to say, get back your own life. And that's just looking at the say, gay aspect of it. Um, 
because if you look at um, um, life quality, I think it's um, 36. I might lie now about mm -hmm. the numbers, but I think it's 36 percent of the people that are identifying as LGBTQ plus uh, are not, say, happy in their lives or they're wow. saying that they have some kind of uh, issue. And then if you look at uh, straight people, it's about 22% that has the same. So then the, the, the gap between the 14% is basically just from being a, a gay minority and how that impacts your life. So then to kind of uh, be pushing a little bit in, in this and trying to find out how we can solve it, how we can, uh, say, inspire inclusion mm. on this, how um, we can take actions in our daily lives, raise unconscious bias in our minds to, to create this inclusion. And I don't think this goes only for, for gay people, but also for... Uh, racial issues or any kind of, of discrimination that can happen in any type of minority yeah. and just being in a having a kind of awareness bringing Rob up to mind. Oh awareness is like a key theme in this conversation. I think yes. you've chosen to live parts of your life in a way that's very public and very accessible. Mm. What do you feel how do you feel this contributes to awareness or visibility or what have been some reactions to this that reassure you that this is what you need to be doing? I think at first, so, so what I did, for the people that don't know, I was on a reality show in Norway uh, that's about surviving on a farm. <laughs> and I think <laughs> my biggest fear on joining in on that TV show was people judging me for being uh, in a lesbian relationship. So I almost didn't join the show because I was scared about the feedback and how people would react and all the... Uh, all the bad mouthing that would mm. come from, say, coming from that minority background. And th this is Norway um, and my emotions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then I decided, okay, uh, let's do it. And coming on the show, um, my mind was set to either I go for it or I let people's opinion hold me back. And then if I let people's opinion hold me back, then I will never, I will never say blossom into someone yeah. that's happy about my lifestyle, etc. So that was like a pivotal moment, something that was very influential. Yeah, like when I just set my yeah. mind to that. And then all the feedback, once we got on TV, was uh, me and my fiancé. Uh, both of us were on there. And all the feedback that we got, like all the lives that we know we saved, all the parents oh. that messaged us, all the grandparents, all the children themselves, even the gay men in straight marriages. Uh, I mean, there's, yeah. it's, it's kind of incredible how much visibility can just impact your life because I see someone like me. Uh, and that's also, uh, say, a mindset to bring into the workplace that, say, if, uh, if you um, recruit more gay people, I'm not the only gay person. Or if you uh, recruit uh, more black people, that person's not the only black yeah. person. Like, yeah. if you use diversity as a part of your recruitment plan and bring people from different cultures yeah. together and say also several from each culture, then you'll be, in my mind, better able to actually create the inclusion that you really want in the workplace to to create the safety of there's more people like me yeah and this makes so much sense because what what's out of sight is out of mind and if you don't see it you can't believe it and you can't relate to it so yeah for so many reasons this kind of concept of visibility is so tied to this concept of equality or diversity or inclusion so it, it makes a lot of sense that 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 would be the case yeah and just like being visible, yeah, saving lives, yeah, and that was also my my motivation when I wrote my book. Like, I want everybody to know that they're not alone with feeling all these feelings. Yeah. Uh, and if you can read something, relate to it, or have someone uh, with your story to relate to, uh, or background to relate to, both in the workplace and a professional um, uh, and your private life. 
I think it creates a feeling of safety. Definitely. And then and, and in that lens, even more, you see people can see you as a successful person and a family person and a friendly person, acceptable and everything. So I, I think that kind of rings very true. Yeah, yeah. Did you receive any um, feedback or any story or any kind of reaction to, to the book or to, to your participants in the reality TV show that was touching in particular? I think so much that you kind of almost don't really grasp the concept of what the feedback you really get is. Because say when you're in the middle of it all and it's say burning around you, Uh, you're reading these feedback messages and then maybe you don't actually spend the time to read yeah. those messages and actually let each, each message get to your heart. Mm. So it's now when it's calmed down a little bit more, the whole thing about the TV show and the book is a year old now, then it's easier to kind of every feedback you get, it's easier to, to say get to heart so that you actually understand, okay, I actually did save this life. I actually did change that life. Uh, and, and the impact you can have simply by existing and being you. It's kind of, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's just amazing because one of the feedbacks that I think got to me the most was a girl that sent me a message and she, she said, you impacted me before you were famous hmm. because I was the girl next door. And I was the person that she could relate to. And that brings it down to what all of us are. Like everyone in this room, in this workplace, we are all a representative from our own background. And say if there's someone working in, in something from a different country and someone's coming into an interview yeah. and they say, me too. Yeah. And they're like, <laughs> there's belonging yeah 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 and uh, belonging is, is the glue to every human interaction and belonging is how you create motivation uh, and wanting to stay at a workplace and uh, yeah uh, okay you're this is the perfect <laughs> transition for us for the next uh, okay. kind of topic that I wanted to bring up that yeah. I know is near and dear to your heart but mm. to get there I have a riddle for you And I didn't okay. share this with you previously because I wanted your genuine reaction. But Nelson, our software development manager, asked me this. And I think it's a fantastic riddle. So stop me if you've heard it. But here's how it goes. Imagine a father and a son that are driving in a car. And suddenly they're met with a horrible car accident. And it's a terrible crash. Do you know this one? It's the surgeon. <laughs> I'll, I'll, it's ask a, it's it's I'll ask it's it again. I'll ask it again, and then I'll one. say, yeah. I'll say, kind of what's the the brilliant, kind of yeah. mind blowing thing about this? It was actually this. one of the things that I wanted to to say. Say no, <laughs> like, yeah, it really is <laughs> great. It's amazing. Yeah, great minds. Yeah. yeah. So, so the the father and the son are driving in their car. Terrible car crash happens. The father dies straight away, and the son is in critical condition. Rush to the ER, and just before the operation starts, the surgeon looks at the boy and says, "I can't operate on this boy. He is my child." How can this be? And you already know the answer, but for the listeners, we'll say that this is because the surgeon is the mother of, of the child. And this is somehow the last answer that everyone can think about when they get this riddle. And they would say probably any other thing in the world that comes to mind. They would say things like, oh, that the dad in the original riddle and the original part was a metaphorical father. It wasn't really the father. It was like a priest or something. Or some people are like more progressive and they would say the surgeon is another gay yeah. uh, man and he's the partner. So there's two dads, but they would do everything to kind of rationalize because it's incomprehensible that the surgeon is a mother. Mm. And that is the manifestation of these unconscious biases. 100%. Which is, yeah, I know that's like gets you gets you to take this this topic. And I think that the statistics I was checking up on this, it's a very kind of replicated study and it's done in many settings. I think only 15% of people on average would say the surgeon is the mother. It's it's, it's ridiculous. Isn't and that do, I, I, like it fascinates me so much with these stories that we're not able to think that a surgeon can be a woman. Yeah. And it's also biased. Like, I think any Norwegian, which is supposed to say, have already broken the glass ceiling and yeah, we're yeah. so equal in this country, will use time to be able to get to the answer. Like, like you said, 
like even gay parents as, as an alternative in front of the mom yeah. actually being the surgeon. Yeah, people would bend reality, go through any explanation that the accident never happened. It was all a dream. Like they would go through any explanation just to make it make sense because it cannot possibly be yeah, that yeah. the mother is a surgeon. It's actually, um, it's the same with um, you. I, I'm not gonna, it was some kind of uh, commercial agency that asked 12 year olds uh, to run like a girl. And they ran like super like, because eh, yeah. they ran like a girl. And then they asked a seven year old to do the same. Yeah. And she ran as fast as she can, yeah. could. Yeah. And they asked like, what does run like a girl mean? And she said, run as fast as you can. And that's before, uh, the, say, the, the community's mindset has mm. been able to <clears throat> reach you. So the unconscious bias that we all have is basically I have my racism, my homophobia, my everything in me from growing up in the community that I'm growing up in. And I'm not a homophobe and I'm not a racist, but I do have racist opinions from being in the community that I, that I am. And to be able to actually understand that I have this, I number one, need to be able to think that I do because I want to say that I don't. Yeah. And then I need to be able to raise this un unconscious bias to my mind yeah. and be like, why do I think that? And that's just like when, back to basics, when you look at women and men, the thoughts and feelings that we have towards, okay, men, professional, fit, able, women, nourishing, caring. It, it's, it's the gap. Why shouldn't the mom be the surgeon, right? Why shouldn't she be professional, able? Uh, there, was, there was an analysis once done on, um, I think, Google Books or Google, Google Scholar or something like that, and it analyzed all the words that describe women in literature, in fiction books, versus all the words that describe men in fiction. Yeah. And for men, the most common words were like smart, brave, something like that, successful, things like this. Mm. And for women, it was pretty, shy, timid, yeah. kind, like things like this that are... Yeah. And I think actually we should bring that a little bit back to, to basic because I came across doing some research that if we as women go into salary negotiations, mm. we cannot do it the same way as men do. Mm. Because men are, men, men are awesome. I mean, they walk in and they say, I did this, I earned this, I should have this, and this is what I'm worth. And we accept it because men, they're supposed to be doing it like that. Did you, did you ever negotiate like a man? No, I actually <laughs> haven't. <laughs> and, but, but actually, women shouldn't. Because what, what came, this was a study from uh, Harvard. Uh, so what actually came up as the result is that it breaks with how we see women. Mm. That's the number one. So it breaks with who you are, who I think you are, mm. if you go in and do it like that. Uh, so they said that the reason why you say get um, your salary increased is first and foremost because you're liked and able, of course, but it has a lot to do with liked. And when you as a woman go in and go bam, 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 and you're breaking with the belief on how a woman should act, it goes to a negative aspect. Mm. Uh, so actually the workplace itself has the most responsibility to put women and men on an equal paycheck. Because it would be strategically unwise for women to, to negotiate according to like that a study from Harvard, yeah, yeah. Uh, because we're not we're not uh, those hard players. Yeah. But then it's like, okay, so shouldn't women ask for it? Yeah. But what women are, we're awesome at negotiating on behalf of others. Mm. So I could tell your boss yeah. that you yeah. should have bam 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 <laughs> bam, and that would not affect me, not or it you. would not yeah. affect you yeah. because I'm doing this for you. I'm fighting this battle yeah. for you. So, so it's, it, when you look at the yeah, science fits, there... it fits the bill, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really fascinating how I'm supposed to fight for you, but if I fight for me, then, yeah. then it's bad. What, what other unconscious biases do you think kind of manifest in the workplace context against women or against other kind of minorities, but perhaps primarily women? I think also the 
he's the boss versus she's bossy. Mm. So if a woman, um, there's actually also uh, so, some science <clears throat> on that, where they did, uh, Tankes Mia Agenda did a, a study where it was 100% the same story, yeah. but they switched out uh, the gender of the male and female on students. I think, mm. I think this was in 2015. Uh, but the study showed that the man was quite cool. He was someone that they could grab a beer with after work, et cetera, et cetera. And with um, the male, how they saw the female, same identical story, they didn't like her as much. Ah. She was more of a bossy type they wouldn't want to grab a beer with. Yeah. The female did not have the same gender bias. We had less of it. Mm -hmm. But of course, we are women uh, and uh, see women. Yeah. Um, but but it's just it's fascinating how this unconscious bias goes through both our uh, vision of how we see minorities, how we see women, uh, uh, and, and how I, we need to aspire for inclusion. And I love that these studies are so uh, replicable. Like it's so easy to replicate it and to see the same pattern over and over again. It's not an accident. It's the there's the John and Jennifer study mm -hmm. where CVs are submitted, the exact same CV, the exact education, exact same uh, professional experience. One is John and mm -hmm. one is Jennifer. Yeah. And John is always perceived as much more capable and much more successful and promising as a candidate mm -hmm. than Jennifer, who is, mm -hmm. there's a lot more skepticism towards her. So it's the same kind of core idea of we have similar candidates, same kind of type, just a different name or a different kind of something that gives them away as a different mm. gender and the same results manifest. You, you also see this just uh, looking at the last name, like going away from yeah. the gender gap. Yeah, that's uh, true. I have some friends, uh, both uh, are say, have parents uh, that are not Norwegian and mm. have used their, say, father's name as their last name. Uh, so when applying for work, they had the non-Norwegian yeah, name priming. as their main yeah. Uh, name. Yeah. And they didn't get called into a single interview. Yeah. So after quite some time trying to, uh, to, to apply for jobs, they changed and put their Norwegian name mm. to the one that they applied with and they immediately got an interview. And that is, that is the workplace mindset. Like if you don't speak Norwegian, if you're not Norwegian, it's harder to get an interview. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so the whole, uh, I, th I think companies really underestimate the value of diversity and inclusion being a part of the workplace. I think if you look at companies that have le a leadership group with diversity, is 15.5% more likely to be profitable. Wow. And if you have diversity and inclusion as a focus in the workplace, wow. you will be somewhere between 15 and 35% more profitable. Wow. 15 to 35. It's, it's varying between McKinsey and Harvard on, yeah. on these studies. <laughs> but it's, it's quite a big, like, if you just focus on having people enjoy work, feeling belonging at work, feeling like they're seen and heard and, and safe, yeah. You don't need to come up with all of these crazy things that you need to do to get profit. You just need to make people feel safe because if they feel safe and included and worthwhile, they're also going to be motivated. And they're mm. also going to, once you take away fear from the workplace, mm. you'll also have increased creativity. Oh, perfect. I love I love these points because, yeah. so I think coming from a, a design perspective, I think it's easy to make the argument that a lot of things have been designed on and designed for and tested on men as mm. kind of the primary focus group. And it's anything from iPhones and pianos, like the, the space that you have to spread your fingers has been designed for a man's hand mm. and voice recognition like Siri and Alexa and all these things have been designed with a man, the average man mm. in mind, not the average woman in mind. And as a result, you know, women find themselves kind of struggling to just exist or use things in the world. Mm. And one fantastic example for how this um, uh, changed was um, when Sheryl uh, Sandberg, who worked at Facebook and prior to that at Google, 
uh, became pregnant and then she had to walk from the parking lot to the Google offices and she started to, you know, as her pregnancy developed, she started to feel the struggle of how difficult this is. And, and yeah. she kind of complained to the founders and she says, guys, you have to make this more accessible. It's not accessible for people in every condition, not for pregnant women, but not for others. Mm. And they were kind of blown away by how could it be that they've never noticed that this kind of walk that everyone does all mm. the time every day is not accessible. And of course, it takes kind of a woman or in this case, a pregnant woman. But in any case, it takes the person that has this embodied experience, the lived in experience to notice these things, right? Mm, you need mm. kind of a woman at the table to overcome the default man settings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you think, I'm, I'm curious about your experience about participating or belonging to different systems that have a leadership that, in, that incorporates women rather than men. So for example, companies that you've worked for that had female leadership or, I don't know, a, a, a female kind of politician or something like that. Do, do you feel that affects you in your experience in any way? Well, I think uh, one thing that was very cool in my very first job that I had, I actually had a female founder as, as my boss. Ah. Uh, and she actually won founder of the year in 2006 and she's grown a very successful business. But what was very cool to see and also what I experience a lot in, in work life myself now is that she and say the CMO mm. would be walking alongside customers would come up and try to talk to them, get uh, wanting to have decisions made and like uh, say get to the company. Yeah. And they would always talk to him. Uh -huh. He would always be the one to get the focus and attention. Yeah. Uh, and that is something that I also notice a lot in my everyday, yeah. say, when we're out with, with clients, um, not before they actually see the business card on sales director, they're like, oh my God, you're the decision maker. Hmm. And that was the same with her. Like, once she puts CEO to the table, they're like, oh, you're the decision maker. <laughs> and then they change their focus because, uh, again, subconsciously, we go to the man yeah. and think that he's going to be the one uh, to make the decisions. Do you feel personally, does it do something to your, I don't know, like confidence or d d do you feel more secure in the hands of a female leadership at all? Well, yeah. I, well, I think to me, I, I actually really like working for both men and women. Mm. I don't really, I haven't really thought about uh, a man being a better leader than a woman or a woman being a better leader than a man. Uh, but I think we're probably bringing this different aspects to the table. Uh, if you're looking typically at the stereotypical way of being a woman and being a man, a man will probably be very blunt, very direct, telling you this you can't do, this you can't, mm. we need to do like this. Uh, and then females will probably have a little bit more careful approach. But also, if you look back to the salary negotiation situation, I think that's also how it needs to be. Like, we need to use the advantages of being the mm. gender that we are in the roles that we are and not try to be a man or try to be a woman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, of course, like, if you're a male leader, you should have care and nourishing for, uh, for uh, your employees. And if you're a female leader, you should be able to make decisions. Yeah. But I don't think we should try to be something that we're not. Rather play, this is my strength in this. Yeah. And this is why we want female leaders in the workplace and the diversity in the workplace. Because this is how females can impact. And this is how males can impact. Yeah. Yeah. And also if you look at the suicide rates, if you have a very masculine work culture, that's where you have the highest tendency of suicide. Because you don't have... Uh, the female uh, nourishing, tender, uh, say, feminine values brought to the table. So it's more of a macho type of culture, uh, which, I mean, men are macho, like, by, by no means, but they they also have a sensitive side yeah. that needs to talk, yeah. and they also have the feelings. And they uh, having a diverse workplace, looking at the gender balance, it's, it's a big, big advantage yeah. for the companies. I was once putting together a presentation for way way before Zaptic for one of my clients, and I was looking for a stock photo. And I I think the keywords that I was using was 
woman CEO, and all the images that came up in the image search, search were women in very manly suits with a very like stern expression on their face, very mad yeah. looking, very serious. And it, it was so obvious that it was trying to imitate some kind of masculine leadership qualities because yeah. there is no representation of feminine leadership that could be softer, could be kind of the things that you're talking about more compassionate and that it has value and has advantage, but it really <laughs> it's hard hard to find it. And, and, and there's I don't think there's any study on it. Mm-hmm. Like, or mm-hmm. there might be, but like I, I don't think styles. there's in, enough study yeah. on female leadership and how to best uh, go ahead and be a female leader because I know in every business setting, we always strive to have that little bit of masculinity or kind yeah. of like show that we're tough women able to handle situations and we don't mind this, we don't mind that, blah, blah, blah. So I think... Do you I, find yourself bringing into work settings, do you find yourself adopting these kind of masculine mannerisms sometimes? I, I think I could easily do that if uh, it's an external thing. If, it, if it's internal, uh, I don't think so. Uh, but once it's external, I think it's easy unconsciously to fall into those traps. Yeah. Uh, and also because women are, we work in a tech industry. Mm. And I think, uh, like mentioned, when, when they would go with, uh, between me and my, uh, bleh, when they would walk between, okay, uh, when me and some kind of salesperson are standing next to each other and say I'm the boss, they would go to the man rather than me. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and that's the unconscious part about it. And then to kind of be able to be taken seriously, I think sometimes you do bring up the, the male aspect from your personality to kind of show yeah. the knowledge that you have. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think, what does it mean to have an inclusive workplace? What are we, what could be, what could we be inclusive towards? I think in general, uh, say if you look at recruitment, mm. having an open mind to who you bring to the table. Yeah. I definitely never think diversity should go above competence. I don't think you should be hired because you are female or be hired because you are from that background. I think you should be competent and hired from that background and competent and hired because you're a female. But I don't think it's right to to hire incompetent people to positions where they should be in in, because then you're setting them up for failure. Mm. So also a part of the inclusion is to hire people that are competent and deserve their position so that you don't just put people into a mix where they can't mm. deliver according to, to requirements. Yeah. I, I'd love for you to comment if you have a thought on who can benefit from an inclusive workplace other than just the, the minority that's being included. So what could non-women benefit from or how could non-women benefit from being part of an inclusive workplace even though they themselves are not women? I think a little bit about what we were touching on earlier, uh, the feminine feminine values that you bring to the table mm. and say the impact it has on the environment. Yeah. Uh, and also uh, when you look at minorities, how it increases the creativity because regardless of what people think, if you only hire Norwegian names, like if we if you all come from what they're saying, if, if you, we all are thinking the same way, nobody's thinking, you need to bring people to the table that have different backgrounds, that have different ways of thinking and a different cultural approach to actually be able to, to create a profitability company. Yeah, And it shows the results are 100% clear about higher job satisfaction, motivation, belonging, and everything if you're able to do these inclusion things. And creativity and kind of the, the spirit of the company that you were talking about earlier. So it's not just for the sake of the women that are being included. It has this ripple effect that's desirable for others as well. 100%. It's, it's a company as a whole are winning on us being an inclusive workplace. Yeah. And if you look at gener- uh, Generation C, mm. actually 83% of them are looking at diversity and inclusion from 
a company's perspective when they're choosing a place to work. Ah. So you're actually attracting talents by being an inclusive, in, inclusive workplace as well. Yeah, I can imagine that, like it, looking at the team page to see how many women are there and what am I, I, I remember that when I was interviewing for Zaptec, mm. I, it was one of the first questions that I asked the person who was interviewing me, I was like, where are all the women in the yeah, management? Yeah. So yeah, I definitely think it, it, it matters. Yeah, and that's also more. about the recruitment process. I, many times in recruiting in the tech industry, every time I've been in a recruitment process, I've asked the recruiter, can you find me women? For this position yeah yeah ah and it's it's been close to impossible wow it's it's actually quite ridiculous how few female applicants we have experienced uh in the recruitment processes that i've been in mm. so we've basically only almost hired men and it's not because it's not because uh, the females aren't competent, it's because the females haven't been there despite the recruiter chasing women for the process. Yeah, yeah. So, so back to the theme of inspire inclusion. Whose job is it to inspire inclusion? Who, who's the person who's meant to be the advocate for diversity and inclusion at a workplace? I actually think that the only way you'll be able to truly be able to do it is having it start with board level, yeah. not the HR director asking for, can we please, can yeah, we please? Yeah. But I think if we start at the board level and incorporate it from bottom down, it's much easier. And I think if you look in, in Subtech, uh, we actually, we are having leadership training now to make sure that all of the employees are uh, well taken care of and that the leaders are tooled to actually take care of their employees and be a good leader and have people feel seen. Uh, and of course, this is not um, diversity training to that regards, uh, but I think it's the first stepping stone mm. on the diversity training because if you create safe and good leaders, you'll be able to create a safe workspace that can inspire inclusion in Definitely. many ways. And then we can start with the inclusion workshops and uh, maybe some inclusion training and, and try to have this as an overall strategy for, for subtech. Uh, I, I want to talk a bit about allies and yeah. specifically men. What is, what is the role of men in this kind of International Women's Day, right? This is what we're talking about. What, what about the men? What should they be doing? What is their role in this quest? I think maybe uh, th there's one thing I think that's very interesting, and that's um, what is feminism really? Isn't it that we hate men? Isn't that feminism? I, 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 and that, <laughs> Some that's what would say. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that's the issue because so many men are frightened about the the feminism question. They're thinking, okay, she's a feminist, and that like it's a bad thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. She's a man hater, uh, but I think <laughs> if you look at feminism, what it truly is. It's equal rights between women and men. Yeah. And I think just like starting to understand the concept, it's not that we want to be the boss and like not that we want to be uh, controlling the men and to like take away their roles and all that. It's not about that. It's just about us wanting to be equal to the men and feel valued, feel heard, feel seen and not feel... Uh, underestimated based on the gender that we are. Again, 200 years before we're equal in Western Europe. Yeah. That's that's what we're crying out for. Yeah. We want we want you to not underestimate us. We want you to raise the unconscious bias that you have in your mind and see that this is something that's in the community. It's not you that's bad yeah. for feeling these feelings. Yeah. It's something that we all feel and it's incorporated in all of us. And only by raising awareness to our thoughts and feelings about things, we'll be able to change them. Definitely. And it's not, I mean, this is exactly what makes it not just a fight of women. It, it shouldn't be just women asking for these things. It should be a fight that everyone has, yeah. right? And if men are sitting in a boardroom just with men, they should be saying, oh, something's, something's wrong here, something's off here. It's no. not just a, a women's fight. We need a female touch. We do. Well, let's talk about Zaptec, Tonya. How do you think we're doing at Zaptec? Are we an inclusive workplace? 
I think I think we are, but I I think we can do more, hundred mm-hmm. percent. But if you look at um, say cultures, we're very good at hiring people, like English speaking people, yeah. and like I think. <laughs> Uh, or I think, from my uh, white female perspective, <laughs> I think we're good at it. Uh, but of course, I, there's always things that we can do, like say the inclusion workshops. We can probably mm. be even better with the recruitment process, push harder uh, for it to mm. be um, a diversity uh, recruitment and to try to, to find the correct candidates uh, there and uh, to incorporate it from... A, a board level down, uh, but I think, again, with the leadership training that we're doing, uh, I think it's always been a focus. If you look at the female men balance, it's always been a focus to try to not go too far off yeah. the 50-50 uh, percentage rate. But of course, if you look at uh, the public industry, it's 70% women working there. Mm. I think in the private industry, it's only 36% uh, women working. Uh, So, so of course, if you look at those numbers, it it is, you are one third likely to to find a female for for the job that you're interviewing for in the private industry. Uh, But it doesn't mean that there's not competent, really hardworking women out there, because I I actually believe that uh, women and minorities uh, can bring a lot, a lot, a lot of good things to the table for every company. For sure. And yeah. So we have at Zaptec two out of seven on our on our highest uh, management level, two women mm-hmm. out of out of seven. What do you think that does to the? What's the effect of that on our culture? What do you think people make of that? Well, I think first and foremost uh, that it's a good thing that there's at least two women. <laughs> Uh, but 100%, of course, uh, there, there sh- it should be more of a 50-50 um, rate looking at it. Um, but the, if you look at the 36% in the private mm-hmm. sector in the workplace, we're not too far off. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I wonder the effects of this on candidates who are considering Zaptec. And you mentioned that this is kind of increasingly a factor for younger audiences looking for their next uh, place to work or graduates out of school and they're looking at the company place and, and they want to see themselves, right? They want yeah. to see kind of a future for them and oh, I look like her, I look like her. If they don't see this this person there, um, I, I wonder what's the effect on, on talent or on... Well, of course, there's no black people in our leadership group. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no there's no minorities, I think I could say, in our, our leadership yeah. group. So, of course... <laughs> uh, but, and then there's seven people, so it's also, say, close to impossible to represent the world mm. between those seven people. So, so it's also a question competence versus uh, everybody yeah. being seen. Yeah. Um, but of course, I think in a recruitment process, if there was to be any changes in the leadership group, it's absolutely something that should be taken into account. Uh, that it would be good to to promote inclusion also in the mm. leadership group. And as we <laughs> talked about earlier in the numbers, it's 15% increase in uh, in the profitability for the company if they bring in diversity in the leadership group. So it actually has quite a big impact or quite a l- low effort. It does. And and I think that a lot of, it's it's really easy to find exactly this kind of justification for the benefits of diversifying or the benefits for accommodating a certain minority and having that kind of trickle down and and to to being positive for other groups but at the end of the day i also think it's it's a value-based decision like there it's a decision to be made and whether it's beneficial or not it's like sustainability right sometimes Mm. it's good sometimes like sometimes it's profitable sometimes it's not but it's a value-based decision you decide on something and you stay true to it um, I'm also very curious about your personal experiences because you've mentioned uh, earlier kind of the, the tech industry of which we're a part and it's very obviously male dominant. I'm curious if you find yourself aware of gender dynamics at work 
I, I don't know. I mean, we work in different parts of the company. Yeah. I work at HQ. You work outside. Mm. And I, it happens to me that I'm very often kind of the only woman in, in the room. And it took me a second to, to notice that this is, yeah. you know, something that's repeating here. But it's, mm. it's very often the case for me. And I'm, I'm wondering if you're aware of these things. That is, does it affect your performance in any way? I think when you're in the tech industry and say you're in frontline sales, mm. what you'll encounter is men. Yeah. basically yeah. all the time uh, and and also of course uh, I think all, it is, it's actually quite easy to impress as a woman because they're already thinking that you don't know anything <laughs> about the technology. The, the, the bar is so low. Yeah. Like. <laughs> uh, so, so you have a upside and a downside. The, one, the downside is the fact that you're in, ignored up until the point where you kind of like push your title almost yeah. in their face like hey I am a decision maker. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the other part is once you start to talk, uh, it's say easily yeah. to impress. But then you also have the aspect to where if you're saying something wrong, uh, then you could easily be underestimated yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's for me also. I'm coming from a commercial background. I'm not a technical uh, person. Yeah. Uh, but of course, when you are in sales. You want to know as much of the technical details that your position allows you to to know, and then you have engineers uh, that are professionals and know all the little bits and pieces yeah. uh, that are supposed to know that, and also feeling safe that I know as much as I should and probably a little bit more, and then I have the professionals working with me um, that are knowing it down to the core. Uh, but in my previous workplace, I actually had a team of female with me. Mm. So the engineer was female, the project leader was female, and me as a salesperson was female. Oh, and that a was different energy. You felt yeah. like it was like you walked in with a little power crew <laughs> of females, and everybody, when you walked into the room, they looked at you like, are you in the wrong setting? Like such a male-dominated industry. Yeah, yeah. And then you're coming in only female. Yeah. Uh, I have to say that at, at Zaptek, and I don't know if it's a Norwegian thing or if it's a Zaptek thing, but I think there's so much respect for knowledge and expertise, more so than title, rank, years of experience, seniority, like all these things. Yeah. I think there's generally a lot of willingness to listen to somebody's kind of well-argued position on something that, that is very special and not that common. I think it's Zaptek, we're very good at that. Mm. I've never thought about rank yeah. in Zaptek, uh, and I've never thought about me not being able to speak if I'm in a meeting room with people mm. uh, yeah. uh, or by the coffee machine yeah. to that regard. So I feel like we're very low on the bar and that also to me signals a feeling of safety that you need in a workplace to be able to to have creativity and belonging. I agree. Mm. So, so what still do you think we should be working on? What what changes would you like to see at Zaptek? Well, I think now we're we're on a stepping stone with leadership right. program, one hundred percent. I right. think that's a great great yes. contribution. All leaders in Zaptek are getting an education, and then I think we should start to look at, um, say, workshops uh, for diversity and inclusion, uh, and also uh, training on it and to raise, say, unconscious bias that follows uh, and basically to, to be able to just lift the feeling of safety because very often if, say, if you and I are having a discussion uh, and we might disagree on something, we're not necessarily aware of the background that we're coming from yeah. and why this is important to you and why this is important to me. Yeah. And as a human, we very often would go into a defensive corner yep. uh, because I feel like my pride is uh, being shattered or whatever if I'm wrong here, yeah. blah, 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 typical human uh, behavior. <laughs> uh, and if we're able to kind of push down these walls and be safe uh, when in the conversation, we can have a discussion without considering it a conflict. Super. And it's really important, again, for the point of creativity and diversity of thought, this idea of psychological safety, which is exactly what you're describing, like the ability to feel that you're in a safe space to question, to think out loud, to throw a crazy idea into the room that yeah. might be a good idea, but mm. you will never feel, if you don't feel safe, it will never kind of 
be voiced. And, and yeah, these are definitely things that are beneficial yeah. for workplace. And then it might be a crazy idea, say, coming from you, and then it gives yeah. me a lie. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, well, what about this? <laughs> and then, like, together we made this awesome yeah. idea yeah. because we were Building. daring yeah. to throw out the crazy thoughts. Yeah, definitely. All right, are you ready for a round of rapid fire questions before okay. we wrap up? Shoot, shoot, shoot. Shoot, shoot, shoot. All right. Do you have any go-to resource, like a book or like a podcast, that you find uh, particularly insightful about diversity or inclusion? Um, I think maybe uh, the main podcast I've listened to over the years has been Power Ladies podcast. Oh, I don't know that by one. By Iria Oftedal. Uh, she, Is it in Norwegian? It's in Norwegian, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. It's not necessarily uh, only side diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. but she's... Um, interviewing different female leaders or some women with uh, a cool thing that she's done like a power woman yeah, <laughs> yeah. so so it's a very cool podcast where you can uh, collect uh, a lot of inspiration and uh, and thoughts oh very cool if you could pick one person living or historical to interview about their own personal experiences about inclusion or exclusion who would that be you would be interviewing them who would that be um, maybe Barack Obama. Ah. Yeah. My, my first thought always when, when who would you want to meet would be Brene <laughs> Brown, but I don't know how much <laughs> thought she's had about inclusion uh, and exclusion. So I think Barack Obama would be a cooler choice because he's coming from uh, being the first black yeah. uh, American president, which yeah. is super cool. Uh, originally, he was a, a pretty uh, poor speaker from what I heard. And ah, then that's he was hard to trained, imagine. Yeah, and then he was trained into becoming an awesome wow. speaker. Uh, so I think he's really uh, been working a lot with himself to come to the point where he's at, and it would be cool to kind of pick his brain on on his journey. Yeah, and imagine a dinner with Brene Brown, Barack Obama, and yourself. I would be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> What is, so if we spoke earlier that a lot of the things in the world have been designed for men, like the iPhone and the piano and so on, what is one thing that must be redesigned for women? Well, I think uh, basically every medicine out there is also yeah, only yeah. designed for men. The seat belts yeah. are made for men. The earbags are made for men. So every, say, safety aspect thought about yeah. out there in the world has been safety for men and not safety for female. But I think one thing, now I don't, I'm not uh, covered by this, but the birth control pill, mm. uh, I think they should look more into a birth control pill for men because right now females are the ones that are carrying all the weight. Yeah. And I know there was a test <laughs> for men, uh, but they got a little bit of a headache, so they stopped the testing. <laughs> uh, and this is like the birth control pill is a headache, literally, for so many <laughs> women out there because of the hormones already in our body, how it messes with our yeah, hormones. Yeah. And, you know, I think we, we should have some equal weight on the birth control pill. Uh, luckily, I don't have to take it <laughs> since I'm engaged with a woman. <laughs> but I think men should, uh, should do their little bit of uh, Definitely. lifting here. That would be a good one. Uh, what is the most valuable advice that you've received that kind of fueled your activism for inclusion? Hmm. Advice. Or what advice would you give to somebody who wants to be an advocate for inclusion? Well, I think I, th I think it's such a big theme. Hmm. It's uh, such a uh, it's uh, kind of hard to just take it all down. Uh, to, to one thing, but definitely having an open mind, uh, try to be conscious about your un un own unconscious uh, thoughts and feelings. Why do I feel this way? Why do I behave this way? And to any company, like, why would you hire someone and not get their full potential? Hmm. Because if you're a company that hire, say, someone because they have a diversity background and you want to show to like we care about diversity and you don't care about inclusion, you're hiring someone and you're not really 
finding their greatness. Yeah. So if you create this safe space for anyone coming from minority backgrounds to be in this safe, diverse workplace, which also are able to inspire inclusion, which inclusion is more important than diversity because mm. diversity is just a lot of people, mm. but how you put them together right. and, and kind of collect their competence is what creates the inclusion. Uh, so you want to be able to give them the, the feeling of safety to actually blossom in your company. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Okay, two more. Complete the following sentence, complete the blank. An inclusive workplace is? Safe and belonging. Uh, uh, I think so, yeah. A, a place of safety and belonging where you can achieve creativity oh. together as a team. That's great. And the final one, a successful woman is someone who cares about other people and who is wanting to, um, to be happy. I think success in many ways is measured in happiness. Do you live the life that you want to live? Ah, that's beautiful. Yes and no, or yes or no. Because I don't think success comes from money, position, what you do is from how happy you are and which life you chose to live. Oh, that's very beautiful. And that brings us to a wrap. Is there any anything else that you would want to share on the topic of inclusion before we wrap up? I think, wait, I'll just, I, there was one thing I felt like I needed to have that one. Um, yeah, okay, I, I actually kind of said it, but... Um, Diversity and inclusion is not a talking game, it's an action plan. And that is something that we all need to kind of bring with us out of this talk. Definitely. That's a great uh, takeaway to, <laughs> to take with us. This was fun. Yes, this was fun. This, this was fun. Week. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for listening. We hope you found it interesting. Definitely. Thank you.